was, uh, I was a friend of mine, I uh, went to church with in Noble for a long time, well, when I was like a, a teenager, her husband was the youth director at the Little Methodist Church in Noble, and there was like two of us in here because it was such a tiny church. But then I ended up uh, teaching their daughter uh, dance for years. She was my dance school when I had uh, my dance student when I had my dance school, and uh, she was talking about an episode she'd had a year ago. Yesterday was the anniversary of how she was getting tired and just falling asleep, and they couldn't wake her up. They didn't know what was going on, and she has scoliosis and is in a wheelchair now. Old. She didn't used to be. But um, her body quit making blood. And when they finally took her to the emergency room, uh, she didn't have enough blood for them to even sample to get her blood type. It was that bad. She had to get pint upon pint and almost died, as you can imagine. Suffered some memory loss because of not enough brain, uh, blood in the brain, and all this. Anyway, she was posting about all this and giving the details. And I didn't realize because I've known that family. Oh gosh, how long have I been graduated? We just had our year. For about 45 years or so, I've known that family and I didn't know the details of all that. But she said, but God, and I was like, it's never over until God says it's over. And that's what I was reminded of, Reba, when you sang, is you had this glorious, beautiful voice that you have shared your gift and blessed so many people for the glory of God. And even though in the last several months you kind of felt like that voice was taken from you because you couldn't get your breath and you didn't have the strength to get through a whole song, it's not over till God says it's over. Amen? Amen. 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 So that just, that should encourage us all. All right. Our uh, scripture this morning, I'm going backing up uh, to Revelations 2 again, to just the preface of what Jesus said to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos before he, before he started addressing all the churches. It's Revelation chapter 2, verses 9 through 20. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And I want to stop there. He was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Remember, I told you why they exiled him. Uh, they tried to kill him, and it scared him so bad that they couldn't, they exiled him. So he's saying, I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me, and he said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands 
are the seven churches. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this morning we come to the end of this sermon series on the seven churches from the book of Revelation. I intended to unpack the opening and closing statements of each letter that have so much hidden meaning. But after delving into that this past week, I soon realized that it would definitely need to be done in a Bible study setting because there is so much content to cover. So this morning, I'm instead going to conclude with the summarizing of how some of the churches got it right and some of them definitely got it wrong when it comes to being the church we are called to be according to Jesus and what we can learn from all of that regarding our churches today. The church of Ephesus was the church that lost their first love. They were the light and the city on the hill. They were a glorious lampstand for Jesus in the midst of a very dark, occultic, satanic city that was literally, literally under the demonic, the rule of demonic principalities and the powers of darkness that Paul teaches about in the book of Ephesians when he says you're not fighting against flesh and blood. Right? This church and its people had been radically converted and delivered from Satanism, from witchcraft, and other occult and pagan practices. And now, these converted Christians were doing all kinds of good works for the kingdom. They were keeping the faith. They were persevering, never giving up the fight, running the race before them. They refused to tolerate the evil that was all around them. And they had no time or tolerance for false doctrine and leaders who were frauds, <laughs> nor should we. In almost every way, they really got it right. Let's say by the book. <laughs> Probably not that book. <laughs> but, but by their textbook, they really got it right. But in the midst of their radical deliverance from evil influences, in the midst of their life-changing salvation and transformation, in the midst of the doing all of the good works and keeping the faith and being committed to live righteous and holy lives, in the midst of their very good discernment regarding false doctrine and fraudulent leaders, in the midst of all of these things, they lost the most important thing of all. Their first love. They lost their passionate love for Jesus. You know, love is not just something you talk about. Love is something that you demonstrate. They had become mighty laborers of the faith, but lived from a place of principle instead of relationship. Are you hearing me? They were good at keeping all the rules, but they didn't have an intimate relationship with Jesus. They were following his ways except that one big greatest commandment of all, to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and love your neighbor like you love yourself. They had begun living out their faith from a place of doctrine, a place of being really good rule keepers rather than a place of authentic love for Jesus. It creates kind of a sterile faith. One so sterile that nothing can grow there. I've told, I had a couple of my friends and I have shared in the last couple of years that we have tried to be so overly sanitized <laughs> during this COVID thing that I can't help but think we've probably done some harm to our immune systems. You know, it's good to get out of the dirt and <laughs> to be exposed a little bit to those things so we can build up a natural immunity to them. But instead, we've been told to go hide in the cave and sterilize everything. And you know, people sterilize the things in their house when no one else has been there. <laughs> I've done it too. But that's what happens. When you become so sterile, nothing can grow there. The church of Smyrna was the persecuted church. 
They were accused of political rebellion because they refused any kind of emperor worship. Now they were willing to pray for Caesar, but they absolutely were not going to pray to him. As a result, the leaders of the city of Smyrna and the Roman government made it difficult for these followers of Jesus by making it almost impossible to, be, to have a business or to be in commerce or to earn a living for their families. And they became financially impoverished as a result. But Jesus reminds them in his letter to them that they weren't as poor as it might seem. They may be lacking financially speaking, but they were rich, is what Jesus said. You're so rich in what truly matters. Your faithful obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the greatest treasure of all. Jesus told them that he knew of their poverty, and he knew of their immeasurable wealth they possessed that they were unaware of. And that is the heavenly truth that the gospel is worth more than all the gold in the world. It has the power to uphold and strengthen God's people through the worst persecutions and even in poverty and financial hardship. Jesus tells them that he saw all of the persecution and slander that was going on and he encouraged them for being true believers regardless of the cost. The church of Smyrna is the only church of the seven churches for which there was absolutely no criticism. The church of Pergamum was the compromised church. Some of the Pergamon Christians had been enticed to participate in the pagan cult meals. It sounds so weird to us today, I know. It's like, who has a pagan cult meal? <laughs> you know, I mean, it just sounds crazy. But if you think about it, they would just have these big parties and celebrations and this feast, and they would uh, dedicate it all to those pagan gods. I mean, it sounds so um, foreign and, and it's like something that would never happen, but when you consider how we gather for celebrations and feasts and everything, and they would they would make it all as this sacrificial offering to the gods, and then they would eat that. So they had enticed, they had become enticed to participate in these things along with sexually immoral activities that were so prevalent in all of these cities, actually. Most of them had been converted out of this pagan satanic lifestyle. But, they were starting to pick up on some of those old pagan habits. They thought they could have just a little bit, they could indulge a little bit in all of this so they could get with all their old friends, you know, and gather around and, yeah, we're, we're just going to have a meal with them and probably some of those other activities with them, whatever. We still believe in Jesus. They thought, what could be the harm? <laughs> they were on their way to losing their way. That's the harm. And Jesus told them they needed to stop. They had become not only a compromised church, but they had also become a compromising church. Those who weren't actually participating in those activities knew it was going on and said nothing which in the eyes of Jesus was just as bad in the church. And Jesus had one word to say to them. He said, repent. Repent's not this horrible word. Everyone, you, we hear the word repent, and we think of that, you know, crazy evangelist standing on the street corner in New York City with a big sign saying, repent or go to hell. You know? I mean, that's what we think. But repent just means Get your head right. It means change your way of thinking. That's what repent means. And Jesus told them, repent. He commended them for their faithfulness, especially after witnessing the brutal death of one of their own leaders, Antipas, that we talked about when he was burned in that bronze bull. But Jesus was so deeply concerned about them because they had become tolerant of all of the people around 
them doing the things they knew were not right. And even though they were living smack dab in the middle of hell on earth by the words of Jesus, he says, you live in that city where the throne of Satan is. Even though they were living there, he still expected them to be uncompromising holy people. They didn't get that as a free pass. The church of Thyatira was the corrupted church. They had a lot of good things going on. They had demonstrated great works and great love. And Jesus tells them that their love was even greater than what they had when they started their church. The opposite of the church of Ephesus. But even so, many of them were tolerating false teaching and immoral behavior. And by tolerating it, it's like they knew it was wrong and they were letting it be taught in their midst. In fact, there was someone among them that was so wicked that was teaching this false doctrine. They were so wicked, so despicable, and causing so much damage and corruption to their church that Jesus compared that person to the likes of Jezebel. I struggle sometimes not getting a religious attitude <laughs> in the silliest of situations. I'm just going to be honest with you. Things that probably don't matter to the Lord at all. But forever there is this little uh, sauce you make with cranberries and pineapple that goes along with ham. It's called Jezebel sauce. And I'm like, I'm not making this sauce. I don't, the Lord doesn't matter, but it just, it pains my heart. And if somebody's named Jezebel, bless them. But I mean, they were so specific about Jezebel and how much disdain Jesus had for her because of all the harm she did and all the prophets that she killed. I was like, I just am not comfortable with sauce called Jezebel. Can we call it Mary Lou sauce or something? You know, I just, I know. I'm just being vulnerable telling you guys how silly I can be. Because that really has nothing to do with my walk with God. That's just some me going over the top with a personal conviction on that Jezebel name. <laughs> I'm human too. But it really was a huge, huge deal that Jesus compared this person to Jezebel. Because he was basically saying, that's as bad as you can get if you're like that person. Jezebel was, she was not only immoral, she was not only into Baal worship, which was a pagan god, and having all this sexual immoral, uh, let's just call them ceremonies, <laughs> and, and all those things that they did. She was manipulative, she was murderous, she was controlling, she was writhing with evil and hate. Now you know why I don't like that sauce being called it, because it's just not a good thing to me. She ordered, she even scared Elijah to the cave. It was her that he was running from when he ran to the cave and hid. And God was like, what are you doing in there? <laughs> you know, because God wasn't going to let him be killed. So there were those who would have no part of what was going on with this Jezebel character and her followers. And Jesus told them that he saw them. And he was pleased with their faithfulness. These seven letters were written in the book of Revelation for those that were saved already. These letters were not written for people who didn't know Jesus. These letters were written to congregation that knew Jesus and knew better. And he was straightening them out out of love. That's what scripture says. You correct those you love. If you don't love them, you just leave them to their own devices, right? He loved them too much to say nothing. The church of Sardis was the church of the living dead. They were an overconfident church that was blind to their true spiritual condition. They were surely expecting a big attaboy when they were going to hear this letter that John had for them from the words of Jesus. But instead, it was, out of all of the letters, the most severe reprimand of all. 
In fact, it was one of only two of the letters that didn't have one single word of commendation of something well done. Jesus told them, you have a reputation of being alive, but I know, in fact, you are dead. <laughs> they had to be so puzzled. They were actively involved in the community. They had all the latest innovative ministries. They were paying their bills, paying their apportionments. <laughs> they were feeding the poor. Not one pew was empty on Sunday morning. But even so, Jesus said, yes, I'm aware of how you perceive yourselves of being this thriving, happening church. But in my eyes, I see beyond all those good works, and you're as good as dead. How could that be? How could you possibly have packed worship services, tons of volunteers, outstanding community service, financial strength, and be a dead church in the eyes of Jesus? We define, a, we define a dead church as having empty views, don't we? But the church of Sardis was overflowing with people and activities. And based on the way that Jesus addressed them in this letter, it appears that all their good works for the kingdom were lacking something very important. They had left out the most important element of all, something every church absolutely must be connected to if they are to be the church that Jesus calls them to be, a church worthy to be his bride. And that critical element is having spirit-led ministry and not man-led ministry. Oh, we get way off on that. And it's so easy to do. I mean, listen, as, as a role pastor, I know from all of my experiences and the different crazy things that I've learned how to do in my life, I can, I can bring a lot of interesting things to the ministry. And if I'm not careful, I can just start creating ministry because of all the things I've got in my wheelhouse. But that's not how it's supposed to work. It needs to be spirit-led, not man-led. There's a huge difference, and we need to know the difference. If we don't yield to the Holy Spirit and allow him to have his way by leading the way, our ministries will be lifeless. They'll be spiritually ineffective, having very little impact on saving souls and transforming lives. We'll be nothing more than a club of do-gooders. Jesus is calling them out because it's critical to not get in his way, but instead to let him lead the way regardless of how good our activities may be. This is why it's so important for churches to have leaders all the way from the pulpit to the Sunday school classrooms that are individuals who have healthy, intimate relationship with Jesus. They don't know about Jesus. They know Jesus. And they don't just talk about the Holy Spirit as part of the Trinity. They have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. They're spirit-filled leaders. It's so important. But what has happened to the state of the church as a whole, we're so desperate to get anybody to fill the position that we just, if, if they're at least saved and living somewhat of a good life, then we tend to be okay with that because who else do we have? Not okay. What we need to instead be doing is for the Lord to send someone who's burning with holy fire, who has bold faith and a passion for, to save lost souls. And I don't care if there's just 10 people in your congregation. We pray that prayer and God will show up. He'll send those people. We don't have to just make do. He'll do it. That was what was lacking in the church of Sardis. And sadly, it's what's lacking in a lot of our churches today. The church of Philadelphia was the faithful church. Jesus acknowledged that in the eyes of others, they may have appeared to be on the last leg, barely holding on by a thread, striving to keep what little they had from dying. In fact, practically dead when compared to other churches like the one in Sardis. But in the eyes of Jesus, he said they were very much alive. 
Just like the church of Thyatira was the opposite of the church of Ephesus. The church of Philadelphia was the complete office, the opposite of that happening church of Sardis. From those looking on, people would say their doors would surely be closing any day. In the eyes of the world, they were not relevant at all. They were too small to be a threat to the powers of darkness. They were too weak to accomplish much of anything for the kingdom. Not enough people, not enough money, not enough impact on the community. But how wrong they would have been to draw that conclusion. Because in the eyes of Jesus, they had spiritual strength beyond measure. They were exceedingly capable to make a profound impact in their community for the kingdom. And Jesus commended them for that. There were, there were only two churches of the seven that Jesus had no criticism for. The persecuted church of Smyrna and the faithful church of Philadelphia. Their congregations were godly, faithful, and passionate people concerned about spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. The church of Laodicea was the seventh church, the lukewarm church. They had become unconcerned about the things of God. They believed in God, but they didn't really see their need for God. As a result, Christ's message to them was like no other. He said that he was so disgusted with them that it made him want to spit them out of his mouth because they were the lukewarm warm church, filled with complacent people who didn't reject Jesus, but they sure didn't pursue him. They were somewhere in the middle. They showed up on Sunday morning, but were unaffected by the gospel or the worship or the prayers. They made their appearance and then showed up again the next Sunday. They were a congregation of believers that were looking to be affirmed, not challenged. They were looking to be comfortable, not stretched. They wanted to be told they were holy already, instead of that they still had some work to do. They weren't hot, they weren't cold, they were lukewarm, half-hearted Christians. Keeping up the appearance, going through the motions. They become complacent in their faith. No passion for Christ, no passion to serve Him in ministry, no passion or burden for the redemption of lost souls. And to be clear again, they didn't reject Jesus. But they certainly weren't passionately serving Him. This was the state of these seven churches when John was given this extraordinary vision and revelation, which included an encounter with the risen Christ. And in verse 19 of our text this morning, Jesus tells John, Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. What is now, and what will take place later. In other words, history was going to repeat itself to some extent regarding how future churches would fail and sometimes succeed. Sadly, many of today's churches have lost their first love. They operate from a place of doctrine. There are persecuted churches, compromised churches, compromising churches. There are corrupt churches, churches who have become more like a rock concert than a worship service and draw masses of people that have lost sight of what Jesus might want them to do with their ministries in the midst of all the great ideas of their talented leaders. Unfortunately, the lukewarm and complacent church seems to be the spiritual condition of our time that is most often the culprit in literally snuffing the life out of churches. People get set in a pattern and are unwilling to accept that the Lord is alive and moving and the Holy Spirit is here and he wants to just, just sweep across the land in this holy passion and fire. But so many churches, they just want to hold on as long as they can and the way things have always been and never open to anything that the Lord might be wanting to do that's new and different. We're more comfortable with the Rinse, cycle, repeat. It's happening all over the place. But let us be the faithful church. Unafraid to follow.
follow Jesus at all costs. I just want to, this came to my mind, and I'm about to conclude here. But uh, through the COVID, and I've shared, and, I, and I'm not uh, going to overshare, but in the congregation that I was leading through COVID, I was there six weeks before we had the shutdown that I've shared with you all. <clears throat> and when I decided to reopen, uh, based on what the conference had said, and we were the last church to reopen in our town, and I consulted with all the fellow pastors in the community and the people in the conference, and uh, there was just this large number of people that were utterly opposed to me reopening. And I told them all, I said, you know, you don't have to come. <laughs> We're live streaming everything. Stay home as long as you feel you need to. But Tom and I are going to be at the church, worshiping the Lord with the doors open. And if anyone wants to come and worship with us, they can wear a mask. They don't have to wear a mask. They can stay apart, whatever they're comfortable with. I'm going to be there, and we're going to worship. And that was when the ship went down. That was when things really took a turn for the worse. And I told Tom, I was like, I served the Lord first and my congregation second. And I feel compelled to be there and have his sanctuary open. And trust that everyone can make that decision for themselves on whether to be there. But we were so highly criticized and persecuted to the point where that's why I left sooner than I thought that I would be. And I don't fault them. I know it came out of a genuine concern. But when I say we have to be willing to be the church at all costs, I say that with conviction. Because it was a costly costly decision, but I stood behind it. We have to boldly stand for the things we feel the Lord is convicting us of, and we have to have that passion burning in our hearts for Him and for others to come to know Him, and we have to embrace the ministry of the Holy Spirit to lead us every step of the way. And we have to trust in Him more than we trust in people. We have to trust in God more than we trust in our leaders. We have to surrender fully to him and yield to his holy ways, even when it's not the politically correct thing to do. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us. Even though we're small in number, Father, we, we are big in our love for you. Help us to always be that faithful church that will follow you at all costs, that will make those decisions that might be difficult but are the decisions that honor you and pursue what your plans are for our ministry individually and our ministry as a congregation. Help us to never be compromising, but to always stand firmly on your ways of holiness. Help us to withstand any persecution Keep our fire, our flame, and our heart burning brightly, Holy Spirit, so that we never lose our first love, so that we never become complacent.